All right. Well, so um, this is a reading series that began from the anthology, uh, which was originally an idea and sort of grew and grew. And, and um, it's really wonderful for me to hear and see all of you uh, read the poems that are in the anthology and, and new poems that you've written. Um, I have posted on the chat, if any of you are not familiar with the links to the anthology, they are posted there. You can look at them later. Um, so there's a rich variety of approaches to eco-poetics and um, you'll hear some of them today. So without further ado, I'll introduce the first reader, Daniel Eltringham. Okay. Am I audible? Yeah, excellent. Um, so th thanks very much to the editors of the anthology and, um, and to Cole for the uh, amazing heroic job of putting these readings together. Um, I'm just gonna read my poem from the anthology, which is, I suppose it's built out of fragments of attempts to write this kind of cliched end of the world poem that you keep trying to write again and again, you know, and then you give up because it's too big or something. Um, and I started writing it the night before the election of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil in October 2018, which is where the title comes from. Um, and I guess in a way, the kind of discontinuities between the different attempts to write the poem perhaps are a way of describing that indescribable thing that encompasses world ecological relations under conditions of extraction, degradation, extinction, and so on. Um, so part of, it, part of it was a failed attempt to write a poem about palm oil. I'm sure everyone's tried this. Um, and then I sort of abandoned that um, and went into other things. Um, and it has an epigraph from Bolsonaro before he became president of Brazil um, in, from 2015. A kind of shocking, de really devastatingly brutal um, quotation from a, I think from a press conference that he gave in 2015. And it goes like this. There is no indigenous territory where there aren't minerals. Gold, tin, and magnesium are in these lands, especially in the Amazon, the richest area in the world. I'm not getting into this nonsense of defending land for Indians. So that's our, that's hopefully the outgoing president of um, Brazil. And the poem begins like this. Open season on the resource rich, amped up and ready to asset strip the Amazon, obviously. If it's needless to say, why say it? It, sheer miracle of demural, could mean fresh opportunities for Canadian companies looking to invest in ecocide, genocide too, the peasant matrix, a brown and backward image, fell destroyer carbon cut, ingenious and lovely, the work of the wild. Tarmac sink drive through unprofitable forest weed. Politics never more nakedly in service, nor the worst surer of their creed. Supermarket indecisions in the web of life. Hold up soap, rotate, angle, descry, inspect, reject. Fruitless enough, but how else to be in this world? Nihil in advance. Upfront mourning for the present, feels future because the losses don't show. Each of us at the limit of the limit and straining to see what our eyes avert. Que no quiero verla. In tears looking at a brown hair in Fauna Britannica. Prefers a mosaic, a farm and wood. Living inside it, it's hard to pass its shapely contours of stately plummet. 60% in 50 years, as the event strips away sparse and worsening cover at all levels of life. Form an image of the world that can be recomposed in phase change without motion. Split the particle open and it won't go back. I is another, but pairs of beasts but reinscribe. Another's other and an other. Rage at all the wrong targets from helpless home. Effects of dispersal across networks of blame and gain. Demand the imperative engine. On the back of the soap pack, the telling trace of the visceral reel, eye to eye with the world economy. 
plant one palm firmly on the company map. What greases the great cycle must be the oil, used in everything because it is cheap. The banal beet meted out of the fruit, used in everything because it is cheap. There's a theory of global economy for you right there, of global oikos crouched down in arboreal shade against a dividing wall that shields the view. Que no quiero verla, the blood. There's an elegant syllogism for relation that is all ye need and all there is. Ah, to know, relation extends the known to the bounds of the, huh. What greases the great cycle is also, because it is cheap, it is used, uh, as everything, cut. This paradigm, which rides on sleep, breaks up. Erosion now, ho-hum diverted by a bog asphodel. Footfall counters in overdrive on Stanage. Well now, well dressed, well managed, well done everyone. A blessing on your watercourse. The money hill unmounted still. An expansive, the fresh forest, but brought beyond bio capacities, lopped and boxed, the plants will grow much better in virgin soil. Expensive, worthwhile to get all the life from the forest expends, cut bamboo, grasses, smaller trees, the method, render to kindling, ringing carved trunk, so sap circulates past value. The pending processes, death is slow, time is short. By close of play today, I want to see vascular veins laid open and the oil leaching out. I want to see the layers of money inherent in the land. At least then we'd know where to start. Harm in passivity, gulls sing, anthropocene scaling, losses cut down the coast. Let's say just hypothetically, we all agree to burn it all, all the hydrocarbons all at once. Crack open the methane lattice. Sit back and wait for the feedback to kick, or hold your ear to the pulsing syncopation of a storm drain in spate. Sea and ice, ice and ocean, dialectical counterpoint, call and answer song, read by measure, watch the levels. Fossils agitate in the lobby, acids, Stranded, a test. Deep water, a test. Gorgon, a test. Sunrise, over bitumen, horizontal. Tar lands keep turning. Frack me sideways, this is not a test. Red wines for red meat. Stupid peak time past silk liquefaction. Limits ongoing full price fares. Extinctive. This city on stilts. Voy ahora. Te quiero, lentic lake, fear no more. Boy agora, the quiet. Benfic bottom, fear no more. Ahora vengo, te veo. Solar hubris, fear no more. Alforja y vega, tango. Not to fear, but fear itself. Still also, profundo. Oh God, make me vegan but not yet. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Our next reader is Morgan Grace Willow. Hello, thank you, Mary. First, I want to acknowledge that I come to you from unceded lands of the Dakota and the Anishinaabe peoples in Minnesota. Um, and also I want to add my thanks to everyone else, to the editors and everyone managing the reading series and everything. So I'm going to read two poems. Um, the first one is from the anthology and it's uh, a poem in three parts. In the second section, I borrow some language from Marianne Moore, um, whose poem, The Pangolin, I'm responding to. So Pangolin 2, after Marianne Moore, one. 
King George III shows up at court in 1820 wearing a new coat of armor, gift from Governor General East India Company Bengal. Trimmed and braided in royal blue and gold, the coat is covered, though not in metal. Large scales conceal his royal highness's heart, shield his shoulders with cap-like sleeves. Smaller scales guard his spleen where otherwise an able knight might direct his lance. These scales once protected a pangolin, the only mammal known to have such keratin-covered layers over its skin. Stripped from the animal, decorated in gold, now fit for a king. Two. Moore calls it splendid near artichoke, the animal layered in spruce cone regularity. The pangolin's adapted foreclaws open anthills, clear the way for its tongue much longer than its body. The tongue tunnels deep into anthills channels, collects a meal along its sticky surface. A pangolin has no bark, no need for teeth. When threatened, it curls, tucks its nose beneath its tail, leaving sharp edged scales to fend off predators. To more, its motion is grace shaped by adversity. Three, Nom Tamao Wildlife Rescue Center, Takeo, Cambodia. A three-year-old female pangolin ambles through leaves and underbrush despite having lost two of her four feet to a poacher's snare. For some, she is a delicacy for healing human kidneys. Others want the keratin from her scales as potion for skin ailments. She may be smuggled in bags of dog biscuits. She may be labeled as frozen fish or communication equipment. She and her kind are the most trafficked species for the scales. More than the elephant for its ivory, more than the rhinoceros for its horn. Just two centuries since King George III and soon the pangolin will be extinct. The next poem I want to read is um, essentially an elegy for topsoil. Topsoil, it takes a thousand years to develop an inch of topsoil. And as you all probably know, our topsoil layers are being rapidly depleted. So it's from this collection, Dodge and Scramble. 1,000 years. Nothing but worms and microbes, granite crushed, not yet sand, not yet soil, pieces. Then a leaf falls, another. Chlorophyll makes its farewell, leaf after leaf for 1,000 years, and roots of grasses where tops mirror the roiling of black-bellied clouds as they travel violently eastward. Then worms, beetles, spiders enjoy the mess leave carcasses, their spindly legs added to leaf veins, to grass roots, netted firm as a spider's web. Add bark, singed the branch lightning's gift, wood rotting and soft, its inside now home to larva, cicadas, locusts. Their habitat dies, they die, soils born to breathe, even as Ezra leaves for Europe, roots filtering a network deep, holding granules, Sand, granite kiss, leaf mold, bark rot, bug wings, worm dung. Add toads, add one pond water, mosquitoes, add bats and swallows. Add bison's weight, prairie dog dung. Add red winged blackbird and meadowlark, rabbits, eagles, deer. Before horses hooves, this inch, this black inch, well before the plow blade before town, before railroad track, before World War, before the Russian Revolution, before the Middle Passage, before the Trail of Tears, this inch, this black inch, before computers, before shopping malls, this black inch, before internal combustion, before the soybean gave back its nitrogen, before anhydrous ammonia, before indoor plumbing, this inch, this prairie inch, the inches beneath growing corn, squash, and beans. Grow alien tomato, grow purple coneflower, chamomile, wild lettuce, this inch and lamb's quarters, 
this inch and Canadian thistle, this inch, the dandelion, the starling, this inch and dams, this inch and tiling, before fences, up with cribs, aluminum, long and low, before silos, brick, block and blue, before DDT, before crop dusting, before irrigation, this inch before three crop rotation, before the futures market and trade with Russia, with China, before global economy, before the value of the acre fell, before it went up in the wind, this inch, before the river, this inch traveling south, this black inch bleached, this black inch sickened and gray, sorghum and sugar beets, Northrop King, DeKalb, Archer Daniels Midland, the tall grain towers, the fallow fields, the government's plan, the family farm, hog producers, lagoons of shit, this inch percolating, this toxic inch, in creek beds, in the water table, this prized and damaged inch, this 1,000 year old inch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan Grace Willow. Our next reader is Marcella Durand. Hi, can everyone hear me? Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the editors, Mary and Cole, for organizing this um, stupendous marathon series. Um, thank you so much. So I'm gonna um, read this poem that I was really delighted that the editors took called Friskies. Um, and I, I was particularly interested in odd spaces of ecology or ecological intent. In this instant, instance, uh, pet ownership and hoarding. Friskies. Fish found within a deep blue pan, if ripped off at the edges, her digestive system is decompressed under the additive stress found in a bluish container soldered by indifferent, indifference to that which enters heavy lead cans, piles and piles of them to be recycled. Small bugs fly back and forth as an inability to throw away a particular obsessive kind of order. Each item within the pile, no matter how messy looking, is marked an observation as to what she put where, and even though it may look disastrous and flies may be buzzing around it, it's still a pile of something soldered together with such indifference that it was a bunch of ground up animal parts. That's what it's eating, digesting itself. It's its own body in there, that bluish metal pan, deep as it eats its own body through an organically ordered system, doesn't know items are there that there. Then I'll read um, Sestina, the deep Christrom. Back from his long voyage across the sea, the general was relieved to hear the deep crystrum of a landlocked river bordered by cottonwoods releasing soft puffs of seeds to collect in a thicket, woo churned in an immense and picturesque study of decay. A chewed up leaf closes, another decay slick and chemical coats the path the general slips and is lost in a root churning tangle of vines and weeds. He hears a whispering crustrum indicating the arrival of another puff and snort from a drifting plant resembling cottonwood. With leaves like the white seeds of a cottonwood releasing wood and cotton, the stump decayed into the likeness of another plant vanished in a puff when its last habitat was found to be generally unsafe for children as it releases crustrum to fall on their heads and root churns slowly. And the children crying woo churn sea tears, leaving salt rivulets that poison cottonwood. Their mother says, for Chris Drum's sake, this peach under the pouch is all decay. She looks down the path for the lost general who, looking around him, only sees puff after seed sacked puff, an ocean of puffs, each planting themselves to woo churn themselves into a fine general maze of extremely tiny cottonwoods with roots extending out into water and prone to decay, just as teeth and hair and bones and that substance known as crystrum, which could slightly 
very slightly resemble a substance also known as Christrom, but differentiated only by a slight, almost unnoticeable puff occurring after the third S, and with how quickly decay sets in once the cavity has wucherned itself into the dentin of the cottonwood's exterior calcium bark. But the general is no scientist, just an old general who in his fits of rage cuts Christrom down as though it were cottonwood, each branch evaporating in puffs and disappearing into the complex and difficult wucherne of troublesome decay. I'm going to read um, a poem from the book, The Prospect. And this poem is called Things I Used to Find Beautiful. Things I Used to Find Beautiful. Blinking red lights high up to warn airplanes. Radio towers in the middle of fields seeming to extend to the infinite when driving. Driving, being a passenger watching the road fly by blinking red lights across the river atop a development. Developments under construction lit up by floodlights, floodlights of many colors, prospectors, surveyors, the man surveying the middle of a busy street with an orange jacket on to warn pedestrians. Pedestrians passing so close to a heavy vehicle as it speeds up, tires almost to feet, the weight of metal, the paint on metal, the many layers of paint, the wheel and steering, the chrome parts as decorative, the ads for it, things I used to find beautiful, the feeling of construction, what will be uncovered before it is taken, before the surveyed part of the land will be taken, the under of it, the radio of it, the crackle and static extending over so many miles, what used to seem empty as a child, before finding the skeletons, the towers leading one to another, the intricate compositions of wires, poles, and transformers, voices reaching through distance one to another, even if only reciting numbers, even if only measurements, those numbers. Thank you again. Thank you, Marcella. Our next reader is Tom McGuire. Thank you to all the, uh, those who made the readings and the anthology possible. I'm going to read a few poems from my manuscript, Becoming Magpie. Magpie rises coming down to earth. One, on black extended wings, magpie scans and scouts the fallen world with dark devouring eyes from heights pressed still and flat against the sun. So he tracks and targets plain and simple pickings. Some days Magpie brings the bacon home, looking, listening, ear cocked to the ground, scrying for secret signs of tiny maggot flies or beetle grubs whose work it is to feast, to thrive on all that's left behind to ripe and rot and thus help this our spent and weary earth revive. But for to him today portends a different mode of being. Today he'll fly a narrow way, course another path to magpiety by swooping down for carrion comfort. Before he lights though, magpie makes a rainbow show, a kind of wavelength flight on blue black wings, a coaster ride that in the solstice sun hues iridescent green, a rising rush below the sheltering sky, a curving climb by which he nearly clips a twist of scrub oak crowns and falls and dips and lofts again before his sortie ends, touching softly down in meadow grass lush and tall. Two, above the snowbound mountain in a cloudless cobalt sky, it seemed the only moving thing was a jet black magpie eye. Then all went still when within his retina scan, a streak of red on white, a strip of scarlet flesh, into the corvid's focus came, and in that vision, a jigsaw spine of black on white, a heartbeat line that puzzled fine through a slain songbird's skull, a bone ball crimson from the kill. Also there beside the songster's head, an Ouroboros, forsaken and forgotten, a snake of gray and purpled innards coiled round a gizzard bulged by death and grainy sand. 
So magpie lit and feasted. Feed her off battlefields. With a heart joyous nor scared by its own rapacity, magpie looks about and below a bank of clouds bedizening orange and daffodilly skies, he spies killing fields spread all before him. A world not changed since the first blood dim tide came roiling in that morning when somewhere east of Eden, Cain conked Abel, the day that wound, the never healing wound, a wound unbound, rubbed forever raw and round by brothers killing brothers, unworlding wounds of battlegrounds filled by mounds on mounds of tombs. My magpie takes the, uh, the long view historically and many of the tombs he sees of course are for his own kind. Magpies have been systematically captured and hunted in a war of extermination in the West since Lewis and Clark. These explorers actually sent Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson, four caged living magpies and a marmot who in turn sent it to C.W. Peel's Philadelphia Museum. A letter from C.W. Peel to Thomas Jefferson, 12 January, 1806. Dear Mr. Jefferson, the skeletons are so much broken, I fear the bones lost at places where crates were opened. I can mend broken bones, but cannot make good the deficiency of lost ones. So them being mixed together is no great matter. Bones broken or lost hinder the progress of my museum. For every bone must find its fellow bone. Whether I can get an entire skeleton from this mass of fragments, I cannot yet determine. It will be a work of time, the exercise of much patience, which I shall not lament, provided the object is accomplished and the loss of bones proves my only obstacle in the work of restoring to them a semblance of their former life. While the marmot sleeps, the magpie chatters in good health. Now alive in the museum, many creatures most interesting. Diverse other creatures have I preserved in vigorous baptisms of water and arsenic. I shall populate this museum mainly with American beast. Rather than those of other countries, yet for a comparative view, this shop of curiosity shall show specimens from round the globe. Mr. President, I want you much to see these skeletons together. Charles Wilson Peel. Rachel, Rachel Carson's final witness. I hunker in a forest boltered by my brother's blood. I'm a magpie on the margin and own but a paltry heap of pilfered goods, a dried newt, a tattered braid of yarn, a shekel tarnished, four choke cherry pits, a brush once owned by Farrah Fawcett, a shot glass brimmed with DDT. My dwelling is a keep commandeered from a restless linnet. My middle kingdom is the spirit's buon, a desolate dominion shunned even by the sun. My bed's a bowl of twigs lined with mud and finest rootlets. My roof's a dome of sticks and trinkets speckled by starshine. Sometimes I flee to a waste of wilderness at mountain's edge, perched on the ledge between hell and heaven, a spot near the cliff where the angel of light tempted the teacher. I look about and stare with a heart sorrowed and scared. The whole world lies before me, and should the guide I choose be nothing better than a chemical cloud, I cannot lose my way, for we find the massacre no matter where we wander. Where are all the forest trees, the toads and crickets? Where are all the honeybees, the slender-billed grackle and passenger pigeon, the least vermilion flycatcher and cockawee, the highland capper Cayley? Where, oh, where are the snows of yesteryear? Where's the remorse for all this destruction? A prayer for TH, my magpie and me. Raymond Chandler is gazing out the bay window of a beachside rancher. The sky cloudless mirrors the brilliant blue and broad expanse of the Pacific south of Malibu. He turns his eye from sea and sky to his wife, who's reading Stephen Sunday morning in an old cane rocker. Monotone, he says, I don't like the view. Too much ocean. Too many dead men. Too many dead birds. Lord, spare Ted the bird and me. Spare us a sense of doom. Spare us most of the dark side too, but grant us, Lord, sense enough of sin so we don't drown when the blood brim tide comes rolling in. Thank you. Thank you, Tom McGuire. Our next reader is Cole Svensson. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I'm reading, standing on the unceded lands of the Narragansett and the Wapanov peoples here in Rhode Island. And I'd also like to thank the editors of the anthology and also Linda for helping us with this series. Um, as a brief introduction, uh, I'll just say that most of my work deals with land in one way or another, uh, whether it's garden design or land art or a number of other things. Um, and my current project is called Art in Time and the piece in the anthology is from it. And it focuses on landscape artists who in their work approach the genre in a way, a fluid way that avoids its appropriation and its anthropocentrism. Uh, the two pieces that I'm gonna to read today, I'm gonna to read just the beginning of two pieces. Um, I realized it was actually kind of a strange selection in the sense that they in fact focus on land, uh, on sea rather than land. But, um, and I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna start with a piece on the British filmmaker and visual artist named uh, Tacita Dean, and this piece is called In Light of the Sea. Has receded into a further past than is strictly chronological. Will rain again, and the pool of light down will rain, and will I face, and will I walk on back across the plain of water, drawn, minute, precise, a seascape infinite, a glint of flight, a flint struck, run dumb, a lit, or just the white noise of the white voice of the sea speaking across. The sea is always across. Does the boat make it or not? A seascape, unlike a landscape, though they both function by creating more distance than the scene could actually hold, makes you think you're outside the frame. But this is an illusion, and you think that that's what soothes you but it's not, it's the rocking of the clock in the sea. Though best known for her films, Tessa de Dean began her career making drawings. Some early foundational ones were in chalk on blackboards mounted on her studio wall. To draw is into the ephemeral, a mark that began as a scar and then afar becomes a verb. Just as a boat creates a shore, a ship, a rift in time, awakened by a jolt, the sea continued on. And as such, in chalk lost, in the dark erased, often when I consider the desolation of the sea, I imagine it as a place unchanged by the passage of time, a rare prehistoric world where a human being can truly be lost, was now a hand in fog, its name swept off, was never heard holding up a lantern as the chalk stormed on. And the second piece I'm gonna read is the opening of uh, a work on the Algerian installation and video artist named Zineb Sidira, and this is on her piece, Lighthouse in a Sea of Time. The piece opens at night with an oddly bright amber bird flying by against dark hills. The first part of the work consists of four screens on which moving images of short duration are intermittently projected. The bird appears on the screen in the lower right. The four screens often show echoes, often larger details of other screens, just slightly offset in time and scale. Another bird passes and then is enlarged on the screen to the left, at which point we see that, in fact, it's actually a patch of light rippling across the facing cliff at regular intervals. Images flow and juxtapose across the screens. Sometimes all are occupied at once, sometimes only one or two or three. And then it's dawn, very calm, with clouds building up out to sea. A chain link fence runs down to the shore with a bird perched on almost every pole. Cap Caxine Lighthouse, built in 1868 along the coast just outside Algiers. Then the images shift to the Cap Seagley Lighthouse, built in 1906 along an uninhabited stretch of coast about 100 miles away. Its light shines 25 miles out to sea. 
From that high up, you can see far down the coast and the endless waves, the rhythm of days. Another dawn, someone flicks a curtain open across a brilliant window, all wrist. Another window, this one spotted with rain, is echoed on the next screen by rain now running down in streams, while on the next, the camera backs up to give us a longer shot of the storm blowing through the trees, followed by the pale shadow of parallel bars gliding across a pale wall because another window that we can't see is opening. Or it's evening, seen through the rotating panes of the lamp and its shadow cast and seeking a place to land. And then the scale shrinks and we're looking at a pair of binoculars with French windows reflected in one of the lenses. And then the lighthouse seen from land through a lacework of barren branches. A white boat passes far offshore. It's the only time we see a vessel out at sea, which seems ironic as, of course, boats and ships are the only reasons that a lighthouse exists. There are 27 lighthouses along Algeria's 750 mile coastline, all with their keepers, all focused on the night. For that, of course, is when a lighthouse comes alive. Thank you. Thank you, Cole Swenson. Our next reader is Heller Levinson. Hello, uh, everyone hear me? Okay, uh, Hinge as Eco Healer. Since 1970, half the wild animals on the planet have disappeared. The eco health of our language is likewise endangered. The quick click reflex to shrivelize, categorize, and reduce erodes our language with the same dispatch as iceberg decimation. Hinge, with its address of the linguistically undocumented, those terms that have been under-acknowledged, i.e. seep, strives to prosper such preciosities before they succumb to the universal smother. Now I'll read from my just recently published book by Black Widow Press, uh, Seep, and we'll go forward. Seep considered, impinged, impinged upon by multiple asphyxiations, Seep here envisioned is one of the few remaining hygienic pulsations available for evading the ghettoizing binary gridded statistical sterilities intent upon mangling human vitality into frenetic consumption machines. Seep in marinated soak, dribbles, crawls, Scrolls through an unhobbled tumbleweed relieved of formulation, impervious to constriction. See, is the predator of verities, the osmotic ooze, the creep that credulizes. Tenebraid to seepage, to the vertebrae of disappearance, Disparities columnize and lopsided disarray, densities convulse, calibrations formatting the well healed wither in inebriate perambulation. From these halls of serotic seance <clears throat> loams the first herd of petals reminiscence. The road to seep road. Concourse, coalition, currency, conduit, concurrence, gear mesh, crank scuttle, rubber, asphalt, bitumen, foot into tangle, intercourse, dollop, frolic, flare, bumps in the road from, to, destination, direction, goingness, goal, gridded, gridded. How much of the way to is loss? Private road, no through traffic. Be prepared to stop. Road work ahead. Privileging traction. Access equals destiny's lamentation. Alternate route, detour, curves ahead. 
Where in the bend is gradation? Puncture to release, to de-rubber, demotorize, to emanate, disseminate, gestate, gnarled in the bones of signage, squalls from primordial gristle, from paw, fang, gullet, fur, from the bellows of recurring this remission, this legion of spheres, cylindricals, the peat of new geometries, of ratified transpositional glissades, leached to an irretrievable buoyancy. The last poem coming up. Seep in jeopardous descent, plunge perilous. Steeped in diffuse, the ooze that eludes. Antipodal to the inert, the rawed, the deboned, the plucked musculatures. Poised to dislodge, delve, dispatch, hurl. Dismembered from tribe in the lambent lope of cogitation, a uh, dribble grails. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heller Levinson. Our last reader is, is Kathy Weld, and after Kathy reads, please stay for the discussion if you can. Kathy Weld. Um, yeah, sorry, thanks. Um, I'm having to toggle between my screen and because uh, I don't have a printer here in the uh, in the mountains. Um, so I'm a little discombobulated, but I want to thank um, the organizers and um, Marion, Bernard and Sarah um, for editing and Cole for um, really putting this together. Um, I'm going to read um, two uh, poems that were in this particular volume um, first. and. They are, excuse me. Um, the first is called Woman Reef. In each cell of her dead city, a kingdom of symbionts pay tithe in sugars. Who will caress her belly? An orgy of polyps self-propagate there. The yellow, frilly skirts flaring free are stinging tentacles. They girdle her mouth. Kiss her. At full moon, she shrinks from hot water. Her aging genes deploy bad syntax. A shoal of bleached bone is her fishless throat. And then the second poem from um, this volume is called Meadow. Veined with tall grass, stippled black by stalks, made soft by milkweed down, by thaw, it trembles with choice. The choosing lowers us into story, the way the Buick behind the oaks dissolves to bruise, the way grapevine girdles the axle and the bench seat upholstered with moss turns to grotto in a box of rust. In um, thinking about eco-poetics and, um, and, and what the scope of this volume is in um, trying to um, open the question of the more than human world, I found that um, one of my themes is how, how it is that we individually um, come to, to open up to that more than human world. And uh, the last two poems, I think, um, address that question, open that question maybe. Um, this is Caroline, 1786. Pockmarked, I was the daughter too ugly to be loved. 
To muffle myself, I sang my do, re, mi with rags clenched between my teeth. My unrelenting father must not hear my practice. I fled to England, kept esteemed composer brother's books. I swept his hearth, I practiced. Soon his study of harmonics turned our home to physics, grinding glasses for his lenses, optics lectures with scones. What did I really want? The lenses revealed unseen craters, lunar shadows like black soil. I sang just once in public, then said no. We cataloged the double stars together. Then he married. Still, on dew-drenched nights alone, I kept cold watch. Meticulous sweeping gleaned me eight comets. Have you seen how they linger? A blur on the cornea, resolving only when examined, magnified. The tail of white dust, the blue plume of ions running along the solar wind. One might set sail on a night like this. And um, the last poem I'll read is, um, I Walked the Old Road. Most winter evenings after supper, she and I would walk the lean back roads that curved and dipped away from town until we'd walked for miles. Ramshack meadows, ripe in summer, lay stilled by snow. Our route never changed. We crossed the brook, listening to snowbound guttural and at the farmhouse. White walls held Coptic scrolls. We stopped. Bare panes, golden with lamplight. He was cleaning up. She thought she loved me and I him. Love was the darkness moving with us and I did not mind that cold was sear. It just made my nostrils cling. Boot sole caught in beswicken slush had already taught me the peril of wandering on river ice at night. But this slack shadow I entered by winter's nip on earlobe, cheek, was an eyeless portal, edge of earth in full eclipse, a blindfold by which I learned to see the polar aura, the opened room. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Well, so <clears throat> um, now is the time we can all discuss. Uh, feel free to unmute and uh, the chat room will open if you prefer to exchange that way, although it'll be nice to hear your comments and questions. There's so many themes uh, we could pursue with today's reading. I think it'd be interesting to start with something about time, scales of time, <clears throat> varieties of time. Some of you wrote about historical time and some more about process, the slowness of seep, the processes we don't see, the oil being drained by fracking and so on, um, the different ways that time changes. So decay, possibility of regeneration. Anyway, this is a very broad theme, of course, but I thought it might be a place to, to begin. So please, anyone feel free to talk, but of course the readers get first dibs on conversation. Well, there's so many ways to look at time. I mean, um, I mean, I, I, obviously today we live in a, a period of time which is frenetic, uh, hyper, and there's obviously movements. Uh, there's an artistic movement called there's movements called the slow movement. You know, and um, I mean that's kind of what Seep uh, um, is uh, is promoting the slow ooze. Um, so that's kind of what I have to say about it. Um, I, I aspire to have uh, the world globe move toward a slower pace and paying more attention, I think, is a part of um, becoming slower. So next person. 
I, I was struck too by um, the focus on extinction and animals. And I was thinking about Morgan's piece on topsoil and that, and how, how the before kept coming in. And so this sense of time as affecting minerals and the mineral world just as much as it affects the animal world and the whole idea of leaf mold and, and this way that it is tempting uh, to blend from the animal to the mineral world and underscore that, that these are not actually different worlds and that time uh, is a medium um, that, that affects them all. A medium or, and even a substrate for all of the above. Yeah, and which after the comment about how fast time is now, it's like the contrast between how long it takes to develop an inch of soil, for example, and how quickly, how quickly you know, we can destroy things like say the Amazon, uh, the burning of the Amazon and so on, and how many species we can lose so quickly set against this very, very long time frame of the development of what's basic and fundamental to our nourishment. It's, uh, I found that really interesting too, that broad sense of time. And also the way decay came up in a number of people's poems. That was uh, of interest to me as well. Yeah, I think that's so true with your topsoil, just the speed at which this amazing, deep accumulated past, you know, like oil is such a deep accumulated past and we're just taking that past, vaporizing it right into the, the future. It's like, there's no present. It's just this deep past destroying the future. I mean, the time of ecological catastrophe is so strange. It's a time that we can hardly comprehend um and yet the speed with which we can go destroy that deep time is just mind-boggling yeah mm. yeah I, I um uh the the scholar Anne annelise francois has a really good image for that which is the, the the smoking of the last cigarette it's like burning burning it burning it all up in the time it takes to smoke a cigarette um yeah i don't know also, the changing nation, nature of figures of timelessness that no longer quite hold. I think maybe, Cole, you referenced the figure of the sea as timeless, but of course now, because of things like acidification and plastic, I mean, uh, the, the scale of time as it overlays the oceans has just changed for us, as it has for so many different layers of the world we live in. Actually, I'd like to point out that... Um, that that was not me using the term timeless. No, I think that was, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and in fact, the argument in that book is against timelessness uh, and against timeless art and, yeah, arguing that timelessness is a very dangerous concept that uh, takes, seems to detach from causality and excuse responsibility. So... I, I like and believe in Tasso Dean's work a lot, but not the timelessness part. Oh, cool. do, you, do, you, um, do you think that there is a way that um, part of our problem is that we can't um, really quite take this scale in because we, um, you know, we're sort of on our own, we work on our own tempo most of the time in a kind of automatic way. And so I'm wondering, does poetry have a particular role to play in um, trying to help sort of change that tempo? Um, maybe just even for an instant, partly in how you use language and partly in what you, in what you speak about. I thought that uh, in the case of Morgan, um, with that, the inch, the black inch that you had used an incantate, a form of incantation, the way you kept repeating. And I thought that was probably an attempt, it was, it went back almost to an oral tradition. It, it, it was an attempt to keep, keep this um, in our minds and keep it going forward. Um, and, and that way, you know, to have it for all time. So I, I thought I admired the form you used in that poem, the incantation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Cole, Cole, I like that line you had, the rocking of the clock in the sea. Mm-hmm. It was, was that uh, 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 an image from the, the boat or was it like the clock, the sea, the sea sense of time? I was thinking more of, of the sea sense of time and, you know, not wanting to, nothing akin to rhythm, but also distinctly different. And that, that sense, Catherine, of, as you were saying, the scope and that we cannot appreciate the scope. And so how to live with um, the constant recognition of our real limitations and how to not let those limitations allow us to do harm. And I, I liked very much what you said about poetry, you know, maybe just for an instant, maybe just for this split second, giving us the intimation, I think is the term, um, that will allow us to recognize our limitations and might help us try and be accountable to them. Catherine, how do you visualize poetry uh, uh, slowing time or, or making one aware of time? How do you visualize that function as a role? Well, certainly, um, you know, Traditionally, poetry uses musical language, and music is, you know, is it is an experience of time. So when you read a poem linearly, you are um, you are affecting someone's tempo, and I, so all of those choices about um, language diction have a role to play. I'm, I'm not sure I can say exactly, but I think we're all experimenting with that. Uh, no. Yeah, I would add to that, um, that that's where the, for me, the, where the line break comes in, because I feel, as, as I hear the poem in my head and hope my readers and listeners hear the poem, um, where the line break happens is where I, I'm intending for or hoping for a pause, and that's where the slowing down of time can happen there, even for just that one little instance. So formally, I think the line break has a lot to do with that process of slowing time in the language. I, I, I would hope that the poem, independent of the mechanics, musical mechanics of the poem, but what is being put on the page will, uh, let's say, uh, stress the mental capacities of the readers to such an extent that it forces, uh, uh, let's say, the breakage of the usual connections and, 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 and that kind of uh, disruption might point toward a different sense of everything really right disrupting the syntax of the sentence the disrupting the syntax of well no i'm, I'm speaking of, of the thinking that goes into the poem mm. not just the musical mechanics of the poem so that when the reader reads what you're reading he, he maybe struggle with what you're reading but it'll kind of uh, twist his 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 conceptions because yes. their conceptual capacities right I agree. You know, kind of a, a kind of mental mangling, if you will. <laughs> right. Poetry is as as hygiene. <laughs> so it's as if you're so you're describing. Right. Um, sorry, I, I'm thinking that you're describing a kind of interrupting of, of the automatic thought process, and I think that's right. And you know, for example, the the, the way that you use verbs, I think, has that effect. Um, but you know, there's also you know, there's also the interrupting of, of some of the, I don't know, what was um, Jane Hirschfield was talking about the need to, um, to make people um, aware in feeling. So I, I think the musicality part may, may have, um, may work on that part of an individual. So maybe we have to think about all of these things. No, but you have yeah, multiple layers, yeah. I think Marcella's poem actually did what you're talking about in a very elegant way. The poem, Marcella, uh, Things I Used to Find Beautiful, right? This idea of going back in time and being presented actually with two different temporalities at the same time. And what does, make, what does one make of that shift over time as a result of that? I mean, it was very elegant. And these were, these were you know, very common descriptions of things that are readily accessible to people. Uh, but if, yeah, you, you, you listening to your poem, I was like, yeah, of course. I mean, that's beautiful, but also <laughs> not at the same time, right? And you're kind of forced to, to consider your relationship with the temporality of that beauty. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been so interested in the concept of solastalgia as opposed to nostalgia, that nostalgia is this longing for, which is kind of pastoral, right? The pastoral is nostalgic for a time that maybe never was, but solastalgia is like mourning for the environment you used to know. And um, it's like being homesick at the place that for you live, that you already live in. Yeah. And um, I also think about all the grieving we have to do to kind of let go of all these things that used to seem fabulous, like driving and, you know, construction. And I mean, I, I love that stuff, but it's bad. <laughs> so, you know, perhaps we have to go through a period of grieving in the poem. I think of eco poetics as a real space of elegy and grieving. I mean, it, it's necessarily that right now is the elegy and the elegy also used to be a love poem. It was simultaneously a love poem and a poem of grief. You don't have grief without love, right? So. Yeah, and I, I, I suppose the difference is that it, 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 often that feeling is projecting forward into a future. So you're, you're kind of getting ready to mourn stuff. Uh, yeah, think, think, I definitely about, am. Yeah, like preparing preparing yourself or not being able to see hairs anymore. Yeah, that's, um, which, which is a very different affect to the pastoral nostalgic backward 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 um concentration oh. tom you had a line mourning for the present i think it was something like yeah that. exactly that's that's what i was thinking <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and, and i think also just like looking at look, looking at um natural history guides from 20 30 years ago and looking at the habitat range and things like this and then checking how it how it is now and comparing those those uh, rather grim grim data um i think one of the other readers also had the same stats right that with the 50 percent loss since 1980 when, when when this stat came around in terms of biodiversity in the wild um yeah just like i i like how how i i feel like a poem must be quite limited as a as a as a way to even talk about these things <laughs> but one tries <laughs> i was interested in in cold how you're using ekphrastic poetry um i hope i'm pronouncing it ekphrastic ekphrastic to that maybe poetry doesn't have to be alone in in doing this that you can work with another mm. form of art and a this chalk drawings are so beautiful and haunting to hear poetry with. And I, I wonder if you could talk about that a little more about the kind of traditional form of poetry and how you're evolving that to talk about ecological. Yeah. Um, they're all artists who have an oblique but distinct relationship to ecological critique. And often the initial gesture on the part of these people is a way of approaching the landscape genre in a liberating way. Uh, one in particular that takes a phenomenological approach that breaks down the subject object kind of binary. And I think just, you know, sort of large scale gestures like that uh, are really important for helping people think just about um, you know, what's in a frame as not necessarily being within the frame, seeing the frame overflow and recognizing that as a metaphor for the way in which thinking has to overflow, the way in which category has to overflow. Um, a lot of the work I'm looking at is in video or um, film or performance art, things that by their very nature are with, out of a frame or where the frame is problematized by movement. Um, but I've also been really interested in looking at painters who are working within the frame um, and how that can be used nonetheless to suggest a more complicated relationship to the ecosystem that's being depicted and to not flatten it as a portrait of a place, but instead to evoke a notion of uh, system, to evoke a notion of uh, have time 
going on, that this is not a static situation, it cannot be frozen, and yet to use a static medium to do that. And um, it's, it's just really fun to look at um, artists who are doing that and then think about how writing about it might give a kind of doubled view. So you've got the images themselves, but then you've got them refracted through language, which is so qualitatively different and just has a, a way, I think, of maybe breaking open the visual, just as the visual often breaks open language. I wonder, I wonder, Cole, if uh, I could ask as well, following up from that, like in thinking of history in, in, uh, as like a sedimentary store of events or artifacts being momentary stores or sediments or stratum, uh, which preserve moments of history for us to access or sense in the present like, moment, how, how language um, uh, to you acts as a mediator uh, between, say, the the uh, anthropocentric and the non-anthropocentric or the um, the human and the other than human or even between uh, the art and uh, the poet or the poem like what is the role of language in like um, synthesizing these together in open in order to open up time to a future to store a moment of time uh, which remains open um, if that makes sense yeah, I'm interested. I'd love to hear what everyone else thinks about this too. Um, the notion of mediation, and uh, you know, how can one in fact not be a mediator? Maybe bring two things together, but not mediate it so that they, the two things or three things or whatever, um, choose their own ways of of, of interacting. I, th- I think is is maybe. Um, how to stay, how to participate and stay out of the way at the same time. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was also interested in, in the history issues that you're bringing up because I th- we're so used to thinking of time as a continuum and we experience it because of our limitations as a continuum. But in fact, I imagine it's not. And the idea of simply putting two times together. And I'm thinking, of course, instantly of Spicer and his notion that you can befriend people from any other age um, and that you are not held to uh, such a, a string and that, that by evoking things that happened before, uh, you, you fold that continuum. You put those two moments together in a way that they get to interact in in a different way. Um, And so I think there's something a bit similar that happens when you put two different arts together, that you get them sort of folding into each other and creating a a sort of singular point, just as that two historical moments become a singular point when they're put together. I think also, um, not only of Spicer, but of, you know, the notion of the palimpsest in HD as one thing in history interpenetrating another, both, you know, past and present or other sorts of things. Um, I also wonder if some of these issues we're thinking about, we are prompted to think of them right now when, you know, the kind of quarantining aspects of the pandemic have caused our normative actions in time to shift. And, and, and also, while I, I, in parts of me feel in quarantine as busy as ever, but I also think I, maybe I do have a little more time to, to get out of time. <laughs> I'd love to hear what others think both about these issues of, of time, one of the things I was thinking about, it, is it really a matter of fast or slow? Um, that I, that how, how does time warp in different ways or change? Not, how does the quality of time change, not just in its speed, in its texture, in its density, uh, what other ways? Um, but I'd also love to hear what other people think about the, issue of, of blending arts and how language um, can work in with other arts. 
One one of the things that um, I've been experimenting with in the last few years is marrying up my poems with images. Um, and it's kind of hard to, to get my manuscript picked up. People don't seem to want images. It's too expensive to reproduce perhaps. Or, um, But I've taken up photography and I think a lot about, and I take photographs actually of culturally modified trees um, that ostensibly native peoples here in Colorado um, shaped hundreds of years ago. Um, and they're, they're living sculptures, they're living artifacts. Um, and I, I try to capture these trees in different seasons at different times of the day. I, I go out in three feet of snow and I wait for the right light to, to fall on one of these twisted branches. The, the native peoples who, who um, shape these trees, um, shape them for various reasons and, and, they, and they make remarkable bent shapes. Um, so doing photography in those kinds of conditions, once it, when sometimes when it's 10 degrees below zero, um, uh, it's really hard to hold still. Um, and it's really hard to, um, to, to, to take a good photograph. And so it, it got me thinking about the way in which poetry, but all the arts invites us to hold still. And I've kind of developed this philosophy of holding still. Um, um, and it, it's in line with the slow movement. Um, but of course, you know, we can't stop time. Um, like the illusion of uh, Shakespeare's, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, gives the illusion that we can somehow freeze the beloved in time, but of course everything will pass. <laughs> Everything will be gone, um, but we can we can alter our our tempo. We can, and and I think that there are times when we do really, we in fact can still our body that we can that we can bring our body and our minds and our souls to rest. And and so that's what I've been thinking a lot in my art. Cole, responding to uh, your uh, uh, request for how others are working with the visual arts and. Uh, and language. I've been working with the, the artist Linda Lynch. Uh, so how we work is we are working together to uh, converge on a term like seep or pathos or melancholia. And the, the ambition is to densify the term, which as I said, what I call linguistically undocumented terms, uh, specifically like trespass, uh, skew, things that haven't really been availed much in poetry at all. So we bring this arsenal of, 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 of um, art to, to the term to, to cultivate like a garden or woods and, and make a flower and, 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 and emblazon. So that's how I'm working with artists, also with music. Well, I'm, I'm looking sitting, for a ballet company. I'm sitting at the edge of a great fire right now in Fairfax, California. Um, it's 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 flaring out from a place called Point Reyes down the coast, and fire time is very uh, very palpable among all of us sitting here and watching and wondering where it's going to go, how fast it's going to go, and um, the different factors of weather, etc. Um, how they play in, so there's fire time. Um, I call. I really appreciate you bringing up art and um, melding different forms of art together. As as a writer, I find learning about other forms of art, be it music or visual art, um, incredibly inspiring for my writing <laughs> so if nothing else it feeds me um but i i love projects that combine those things there's i want to if if folks don't know about it there's something called broadsided press it was started by my friend and poet liz bradfield and what they do is they they have they pick a poem from any poet that submits one and then they ask artists to submit art responding to the poem and then sometimes they do it in reverse. They'll have a piece of art and then poets will respond to that. And they're, they're broadsides, so they're posters that people just stick up everywhere. Uh, so it's a, very, it's a very wonderful project because it, it gets the art out in the streets, but it is that 
that melding of, of words and images that um, I think is incredibly powerful. So I really appreciate your work, Cole, and I appreciate this discussion. Thanks, everyone. I think to um, my advisor out here in, uh, at CSU Colorado, um, Matthew Cooperman has a, a ecrastic um, collection with Marius Laher and Imago for the Fallen World. And, and just um, reading that or thinking with that and thinking generally how a poem might work in terms of its relation to time in like reading through a poem on a first read, we t- t- with the risk of being too Husserlian here, like the first read feels very much as a primary tension. Everything occurs just in the moment. The second read, when we come back, we retain certain intensities of the poem that um, sound to us more prominently, like the same when we listen to music. Um, and so I, the, the way to me that a poem in itself would would operate with time and um, on time is on a second read or a third read, different intensities palimpsest to top each other and bring to the fore different moments of the poem. And it seems that to set a poem then against a piece of artwork um, it does the same, but the, the, the visual cue of the artwork offers an intensity of the poem that the, the language itself might not be able to do in itself. And it feels that play, that jump across from image to text, um, adds a different mode of palimpsesting, a different mode of accumulation of time in a single line of a poem or something, uh, where, where something comes to the fore. Um, that, that's how I experience at least writing poetry, listening to it, and especially at Frastic Work, um, which has been present numerous times throughout this reading series. And it's, it's so exciting. I, I, I like your focusing on the leap between, because I, I think it is a way of getting a different dynamic, a dynamic that you couldn't get going just in language alone or just in the visual alone, uh, that a third thing happens uh, with when they're juxtaposed. There's a, a force field that's set up that is completely different from either of the journals. I was wondering if, um, uh, the poets could uh, say something about framing. You introduced that word frame earlier, Cole, and uh, it seems like a lot of the processes being discussed here entail pulling something out of its frame. You know, words can pull imagery from its frame and vice versa. Um, there were framing, interesting framing gestures during the readings today, uh, often, you know, in terms of data, a fact about topsoil. Um, or a form, you know, a sistina, a kind of a schema of a poem, or uh, uh, an identification of a species, the magpie, um, and if, uh, an ekphrastic practice. So I'm just sort of wondering about the role of the frame, you know, in, in, in poetics, in eco-poetics, or, or uh, even, um, you know, Daniel, your poem, is sort of the way in which it uh, spilled, continually spilled over the frame of something we might call lyric into something more discursive or hell or even your poems, they're kind of, you know, implicitly positing a frame in their siege and distortion and disruption. Um, so how important is the frame, you know, for poetics, even in, in a kind of eco poetic space where we're seeking to break down uh, differences or make connections or uh, pull things out of their frame? Well, that's such an interesting um, question, especially to do with time and with ekphrastic poetry, because, um, you know, I was thinking about the landscape painting and whether that's a little bit akin to pastoral poetry and the landscape painting would frame it. I mean, so much of what we've apprehended as beautiful or natural is framed, is deliberately framed, right? I mean, if you go through Yellowstone, all the perspective points that you stop and take a photo or frames or how we design our gardens or our windows everything is is framed and um anyway I mean there's a lot to say about this but I, I just am thinking about time versus space um too and that the way we can apprehend space is by putting a frame around it too because otherwise it's infinite space but then time is a progression and time is finite right so Anyway, that, there's a lot to think about there. Thanks for a great thought-provoking uh, time question. Time doesn't have to be finite, but, but uh, going, I, I actually think one of the uh, missions of, of the poem, today's poem, should be to uh, dislodge any notion of, of the frame in, in, uh, uh, to, uh, to enable, an enabler to, as uh, 
Cole was saying, overflow the frame. And it often concerns me, even as we are involved in this uh, frame of eco-poetics, to me, that runs risks and traps. Uh, it, it's become, the ecology is a branch of biology. And when you start, uh, I don't know how that affects the poem by lumping a poem into something called ecological. And we run risks in doing that, because I think, as Cole was saying last uh, last uh, uh, session, that the urban is eco. Um, to me, the definition of an eco poem is simply a good poem by definition. It doesn't have to be about this or that. If, if, it's, if it has a biology and it has a rhythm and it has plasma going, it's a good poem. And, and if it's not, it isn't. So I think we run risks by framing. And um, you don't have to, the frame can also point and indicate a, a, a D frame. So you can work, see it that way. I mean, when you have a book, yes, it's a frame, but can what can the in frame un, un unframe as a potential capacity? So that's that's my take on that, John. Another way to think about that is how to introduce dynamic perspectives, either multiple perspectives yeah. or uh, the viewing platform itself being in motion as if yeah, you're on the train and not on, you know, or on the platform watching the train, but the sense of relative times for different species, for different activities and so on, you know, the time, the slow time of certain processes and mineral processes compared to the rapid time, of, <clears throat> as has been said, of explosive processes and all of these things somehow going on simultaneously, you know, the idea of multiple frames, right? How to bring that in? Um, I like that ab abundant motility. I mean, it, it's easier to see how to do that in a sequence, like with the magpies, where you can take different perspectives, different poems, right? So I, that would be one way, but I, I think it's, it's worth considering. <clears throat> I think sometimes these terms, like ego poetics, what they're really trying to do is not define another genre, but they can provide for poets, and I think the term for a number of years provided an expansion of what could be the poetic. So you see work like Daniel's where all different kinds of things can enter the poetic project because we've cast aside the idea of the nature poem as a particular thing. And because, it, because we know that the way we're thinking the world right now must be an environmental thinking. So what does that do to our language? I, I, to me, it's this big project. It's not really yet another frame. So, you know, you could say, how long will this term be helpful to us? But I think it has been helpful. So, um, and even, I think you can see it in this conversation. I thought today's conversation was particularly broad, which I really appreciated. There was just a lot of different kinds of things people were bringing to it that just the term, I think, kind of, wraps into a conversation like this. Oh, I think it's a great tool, Evan. I, I, I wasn't uh, meaning to under, I mean, I, it just gets to the point that my point was, I think we have to, as I said, these could be traps and risks and we have to always be aware, you know, like Socrates said, self-examine. I mean, then you can have astro-poetics, hydro-poetics, I mean, you can go on and on and they can all be great tools. Yeah. You know, it's, all, it's, it's all to uh, advance. I appreciate your term, the eco health of our language, actually. I, I mean, I thought it was humorous, but actually in a funny way, helpful too. So I appreciated that. Well, I, I, I don't think so much of, of a frames, like the for eco poetics as a frame, but the use of frames in and as eco poetics. So I was thinking, like the Claude glass, for example, that's a kind of you know, way of framing a landscape that could have been taken into a landscape. And it's also a rendering, you know, it, it's a kind of a rendering of something into the consistency of a certain tinted glass. So what, uh, um, um, one of, someone said something about the time, Morgan said something about time, you know, the, the, the poem, sort of the prosody of the poem, speeding up and slowing down time. That's a kind of rendering of time in language. Um, that was sort of what I was, you know, and, and I think even even if your if your aim is to uh, dislodge or undo frames, you, you you just the dialectic is that you have to you have to posit a frame, you know, to do it abstractly to do um, that. Yeah. This, this is oh sorry, this is Eleni talking. Um, yeah, I was just going to say I think Mary, you were talking about uh, different animal experiences of time, and um, I wanted to 
just call out, shout out uh, Darcy Wentworth Thompson's great On Growth and Form, where he has wonderful discussions of experiences, or I don't even know what to say, but um, biological processes in time and the difference between, say, how a fly experiences time versus how we do, and, and the relationship of an actual growing body in t- to time, uh, depending on what kind of body is growing. Um, and that is also a kind of frame, maybe the body as a frame um, to time. I have yeah, a, I, kind of a question for Heller, actually. Is Heller, you were talking about something earlier about disruption, and which kind of reminded me of like derangement of the senses as a way towards change, which is kind of a time time honored alternative way to approaching poetry. And, and to me, that's a little different from a lot of um, eco poetics. One term, which is a little bit documentary poetics too, like they're two kind of strains, I think. And I I was interested in talking about the difference between those two is this idea of eco poetics is disrupting, changing syntax, um, evolving traditional forms. um, But then also eco poetics is is documentation too and close observation. I mean, these are kind of a widely i don't think they're opposed but they're two different kind of sets of poetic tools i think in eco poetics anyway and i was wondering what you and um some of the other people in here thought about that i think about you you're putting uh pitting uh, a disruption against the eco poetic I means one is i don't I, I don't have any restricted notion of what the eco poetic is i mean um, ecology, I mean, the disruption all through the more than human world, I mean, continuously changing, evolving, disrupting, uh, halting, moving. So I wouldn't have, I, I don't, I'm, I don't see any, um, any division personally. I mean, I think, in other words, I think it, 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 a good poem, a, a, a potent poem by definition will alter a, a, a a thinking, but in the reader, if it doesn't cause an alteration, then what good is the poem? I mean, that, that has to shatter what or or inform newly. Let's put it that way. You know, uh, the new news it stays new. Um, so that's kind of what I mean by disruption. In the particular area I'm working in, uh, it, it's a cultivation of of, of a, a language. Uh, these terms that are are, are uh, like hidden, you know, un- underscored, undocumented, and and actually blooming them into a, a world that is as as dense and complex as a woodland or a forest or a universe. I don't know if that answered anything, but uh, one of the thing I think one of the things in my work I, I'm. I experiment, I try to bridge that gap between sort of the uh, the poetic mode that disrupts um, cognition or disrupts uh, uh, closed forms, um, and then the documentation. In a lot of my poems about magpies, I'm trying to go, I'm trying to, in a way, sort of redress the misrepresentation of magpies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I And I dig into like a good magpie, I dig into the historical archive and I'm extracting from whether it's the letters of Charles Wilson Peel to Jefferson or Zebulon Pike's journals or Lewis and Clark's journals, which by the way, are pretty much just catalogs of killing. Um, um, and, and I take that, you know, I'm working with that genre of, of you know, 19th century, 18th century, sort of scientific documentation in the field. And then I try to diversify and I try to find the right form um, uh, in, in terms of traditional forms, but, and then sometimes make my own forms. Um, and I, and it, my magpie poems are all over the place uh, in that, you know, I, uh, that little thing I read, Feeder of Battlefields is actually a sonnet. And, and then I have these like three page catalogs of, uh, listing items from Lewis and Clark's journals. Um, uh, so uh, I, I find myself breaking forms, but then 
to have a conversation with my reader, I, I you know, I have to rely on conventions. I, I think it's a marvelous work you're doing with the magpie. That's a, a great example of magnification, you know. Cool. You know, um, Jonathan? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Joan Ritalik and the poetical, poetical art forms last time. And so I read this article by Jenna Osmond and Jacket on Joan Ritalik and others. And I wonder, it's fascinating. I wonder if you could say some more about that and how it relates to the idea of frame because she talks about intersection, intersecting intentional and accidental that is our world known to us through the sensory and imaginative enactment of complex forms. Hmm. And well, it's funny because I was going to ask, yeah, sorry. At the same time, I'm thinking about people who have written about eco-poetry as being more communal than other kinds of poetry being written now or perhaps ever. I was going to ask Thomas actually about the magpie and if there was a kind of identification with or uh, engagement with the magpie as the process of those poems. And thinking of Eleni said, you know, the body is the frame to time. So, you know, that might be the magpie's body might be the portal to another kind of time, but also to, in my mind, uh, Simon Ortiz's great poem about the magpie. I don't know if you know that one. There's a really wonderful poem that he wrote about finding a magpie on the road. And um, so there's the ways in which, there's a way in which sort of the, you know, maybe it's a fantasy, but that's the way I understand Joanne, uh, understand Joan's poetics in her, in her discussion of alterity, you know, as the, in which the other travels through us. There is, maybe it's a fantasy, a, a kind of agency of the other that we allow into language through a, a you know, be it a listening stance or a communal stance. I mean, I thought of the, the relationship to soil, um, you know, in uh, the poem about topsoil that was read today, uh, is another kind of the project poem. You know, has an ethics to it. But then, the, but then there's you know the, the fantasy part is sort of like okay, that's that's the ethics also is challenging one's fantasy. And Daniel's poetry really does that for me. You know, it's kind of like this these big uh, obdurate, um, difficult realities. You know, which is the, sort of our impact on. You know, maybe that the magpie really doesn't give a damn about Thomas's poems. It just wants wants Thomas and all of us to get out of the way. I don't know. You know. Yeah. So, so I didn't. I hesitated to read that one poem, Rachel Carson's final witness. It's in the voice of a magpie. Uh, I didn't announce that because I was hurried. Um, and and this actually this group. Um, I wrote that poem before I even started thinking about eco poetics and. You know, and and what this group has sort of inspired me to say, you know, what's the limit of my adopting that magpie's voice? I guess, you know, what I'm trying to do is um, I am trying to become magpie in the collection. Uh, and actually at the end of the collection, um, it's experimental, but I actually become a, a bird man. <laughs> and in in the in the tradition of, of Lila Schwibne, the Irish uh, prosmetrium, that, Sweeney, that Seamus Heaney translated as Sweeney Astray. Um, and I, I, I want to become magpie as much as possible in a fantasy way, of course. I want to inhabit magpie's experience historically, materially. Um, I, I want to become a metaphor for magpie. I don't, I don't want the meta, magpie to be a metaphor for me. Um, and as a poet, um, as, a, as a, a younger poet, uh, I got my gray beard, but I'm I'm not that far along as a poet. Um, I to solve the problem of trying to let, write a longer collection. What I said was, I'm going to write in all kinds of different voices, and I'm going to steal like a magpie. I'm, and, and magpies do thieve, and magpies are mimics, and they can learn human language. So why can't I learn? Uh, why can't I try to learn magpie language? That's kind of was my starting point. And so instead of having a single stable uh, lyric voice throughout the collection. I have all these different kinds of voices um, just doing what magpies do. And they, they really can learn how to talk and they can learn how to um, 
uh, mimic human behavior in many ways. A magpie scholar and a library cormorant, perhaps. 